The battle of Villarreal was harder than most people believe. People felt like bedbugs and the firepower of the Reds was very intense. We've got just a few troops to stop the good Aris that came in strength and with the aim to reach Pitoria. It was my first battle. I was in a lawsuit. Several columns attacked us, thousands of men. It, it was serious. They were pounding us with a 150mm cannon from Mollerias. They used the tower of Elosu and they literally cooked us. We had no other choice than to retreat towards Villarreal, towards the main road. It was raining and there was fog. They threw at us all they got, their tanks. They attacked us from Antollar and Vergara. With some reinforcements that started to arrive, we managed to hold them. In the pine forest near Villarreal, we slaughtered more and more Gudaris. They came in like donkeys, without the thrust, nor any military tactics. Good morning, I'm Pep and this is the Spanish Civil War. In this channel and for the next three years, we will follow week by week the Spanish Civil War, its battles and the holocaust that it provoked. Last week, we saw the end of the Battle of Madrid, and with it, the beginning of the siege for the capital. And we let the nationalist forces starting another offensive on Sunday that we follow this week. The main aim of the Franco's attack is to protect their precarious flank, and at the same time, to go back to the war of movement that brought them so many successes at the beginning of the war. They did not enjoy urban warfare. This nationalist offensive is not the only offensive we will talk about this week. We've already mentioned a plan by the Eusko Gudarostea to carry on a strategic offensive towards Villarreal, Victoria and Dalaba. So, let's take a look at what happened in the fields of Spain during this week. To start with the nationalist offensive for the Coruña Road, or Pozuelo Offensive, that we left last week attending us. By the 30th, the 3rd Mixed Brigade still holds its positions when reinforcements start to arrive. The 1st of December, among freezing temperatures, Franco's troops try to continue their push, but a Republican diversionary attack towards La Casta del Campo prevents them from advancing. By the 2nd, with fresh reinforcement and the support of Russian tanks, the Republican forces manage to counterattack and recover their positions at the south of Pozuelo. The next day, the 3rd of December, a last attempt is made by the Francoist columns to pierce the Republican defences, this time near Umera, but to no avail. That same day, they call off the offensive. The casualties during this battle for each side are unknown, but the 3rd Mixed Brigade that managed to hold the Nationalist Trust was almost destroyed and its commander, Galan, wounded. The brigade won the action again until mid-1937. But a unit of the Republic's popular army, outnumbered and outgunned without the extensive fortification network some authors talk about, managed to stop the nationalist forces. As we've seen during the Battle of Madrid, the loyalist forces are gaining in combat ability. But it's too late. In the north of Spain, another offensive was being cooked last week, and it kicks off this week. Three columns of the Eusko Guderostea with a combined strength of up to 20,000 men, supported with three mortar sections, three machine gun sections, 24 artillery pieces of diverse caliber, 15 Soviet tanks and armored cars, and 15 I-15s march against the Francoist positions. The first column, under Captain Ibarrola, with 4,800 men, will capture Maroto, and then follow the line Maroto Isquiza Albertia. The second column under Colonel Cueto Ibáñez that will be relieved from command the first day of the offensive, to his lack of progress, is 10,300 stone and will take Betolaza, then Landa and then Nanclares, carrying on with most of the fighting. Meanwhile, a third column under Aizpuru Mariscan will occupy the Murgi to cover the other column's flanks. The first important objective of the strategic offensive will be the poorly defended town of Villarreal de Álava, with a garrison just 600 strong. By the 30th, 
As the offensive kicks off after an artillery barrage that cuts Villarreal communications and surprises the defenders, the columns start their match, gaining ground easily. The first column under Ibarrola finds itself with some difficulties as it has been spotted by a nationalist reconnaissance plane that bombs them, slowing their progress. Having spotted the enemy column, Franco's authorities managed to send up to 1,000 men with 30 machine guns and 4 cannons from Vitoria to the sector of Villarreal. The first day of the battle. By the 1st of December, the Eusco Godrostea reaches Villarreal and surrounds the poorly defended city, but things started to get dire for the Loyalist forces from that moment. We've seen how the Republican army of the center suffered defeat after defeat until it managed to stop the rebels in the battles of Madrid and the A Coruña road. But it took time and it will take even more to convert an army created by decree into an effective military force. With Dios Cucudarostea the same thing happens. This is its first main offensive and will suffer from its inexperience from its lack of officers and NCOs, and of course the lack of the Great War experience. Three frontal assaults supported by some BA-6 are repelled the same day, and three BAs remain in flames. By the 2nd of December, a hastily assembled 2,000-man column under Alonso de Vega with eight pieces of artillery composed by soldiers, phalanges, carlists and assault guards arrives from Vitoria and breaks the encirclement of Villarreal. That same day, reinforcements from all over Spain start to pour into the nationalist lines, as the battle turns into a battle of attrition. The Republican artillery continues to pound Villarreal as the Francoist reinforcements manage to stop one battalion after another that is sent against them. The 5th, Colonel Ciutat, chief of operations of the Republican Army of the North, to unblock the situation, decides that his troops will try to break the stalemate with an attack from Mount Gorbea to Murguia. But little progress is made. The battle will carry on for almost the whole month of December, but the Republican advance has been already stopped just two days after it has started. The strategic offensive with the objective of capture of Villarreal, Vitoria and maybe Alaba stalled and got stuck in its first objective. We started our episode with the wars from Vicente Ibarra, a phalangist that was part of the Alaba Falange and that took part in the battle. His description of what happened matches what we've been saying. The nationalist forces were, yes, outnumbered and yes, outgunned, but with frontal assaults, the loyalist Gudaris became just cannon fodder. We will follow the events near the Villarreal area as they unfold during the following weeks but it's clear that the Republican strategic offensive had already failed. Before leaving the fields of Spain to take a look at the rear guard, we've got to gaze up the skies. The fourth, a loyalist raid against Naval Moral Airfield, knocks out an entire squadron of Jew 52s. It's not the first time that Franco's planes are caught off guard and destroyed in the ground. Because if they are not destroyed, they bomb following the terror campaign that started by the end of November. And this week, it will be the Palacio of El Infantado in Guadalajara, symbol of the city. After bombing the building, 290 prisoners will be murdered in yet another sucker. But they are not the only people dying behind the enemy lines in loyalist-controlled territory. This week it will be the turn of Ramon Sales, founder of the Free Trade Unions that will be killed by the anarchists. This death is an example of how deeply rooted was the conflict between these two Spains that were killing each other. A member of the Requete, the Carlist Paramilitary Corps, Sales fought against the workers during the years of the Pistolerisma back in the 20s, when the employer gunners of the Free Trade Unions attempted to ignite the conflict by attacking the most moderate members of the anarchist and socialist trade unions searching a violent response, a then state repression. An enemy of the Republic, Sales remained in exile until 1935, when he came back to find himself involved in the coup preparations during spring of 1936. Now he was caught when he was trying to prepare the fifth column in the city of Barcelona. On the other side of the spectrum, at least the political one, the 1st of November, Hans Bemler, 
a German anti-fascist that had been interned in Dachau but managed to escape is killed, together with Louis Schuster, near the Moncloa Palace. Antonia Stern, his ex-partner, will say he was murdered by the GRU, Russian Intelligence Department. But historians like Isdale don't give way to this claim. Following with the deaths in the rear guard, this week we must talk about another death. Or maybe not. We know that the Red Terror left a huge death toll among religious personnel. At least 6,832 of them will be killed during the war at the hands of loyalist militias. Keeping track of the evolution and birth of anti-clericalism in Spain is quite difficult, as we've tried to show in our introductory episode covering the second half of the 19th century, you will find a link to that episode at the end. It is there, with the late spring of nations, that spread of anarchism in the peninsula and the binding of clergy to the Carlist cause, that the anti-clerical feeling started to grow in Spain. Just 50 years before, during the War of Independence, religion and religious personnel had a very important role. Anti-clericalism, anti-Catholicism, and the secularism of the Republican politicians was a threat to the traditional idea of Spain. Spain was born, for some, with the Catholic kings, with expulsions of the Muslims and Jews, and therefore the nation was meant to be Catholic. A non-religious Spain would become a non-Spain for them. And that's another element we have to add to the messy situation we have in Spain, that will also help us to understand why Franco will call his regime a national Catholic regime. This huge digression about religion comes up because this week the Bishop of Barcelona, Manuel Irurita, will be killed. Or will he? Well, there are numerous witnesses that declare that he did not die, that he was saved. Some even say that it was Durruti back at the beginning of the war that saved him. The fact is that historians like Hilary Regué say that he was not killed by anarchists by itself. The mystery behind what happened with Barcelona's bishop is still alive today. Even some DNA tests were done at the beginning of the 21st century, with the remains attributed to the bishop that are held in the Cathedral of Barcelona. The results showed with 99% confidence that Irurita was buried there. Is it the case? Of course not. They could also be the remains of his nephew, Matteo Goni, the body of whom disappeared. Well, it's just another mystery related to the Spanish Civil War. If somebody knows more about the case and wants to share information with us, it will be a pleasure. We can't live without jumping in the international sphere, as it seems that this week the Non-Intervention Committee had lots of works to do. On the second, with the abstention of Portugal, the members of the committee agreed with the presentation of Lord Plymouth's control plan. By the 4th of December, the talks to make the control plan effective take place, and France and Britain trying to approach Germany, Italy, Russia and Portugal to request mediations. The aim was to reach an armistice and prepare a commission to be sent to Spain to help with the transition of power. A plebiscite then will take place with a government made by people that did not involve themselves in the war. But we'll see during the following weeks how this control plan evolves. Because behind the scenes Mussolini will meet with Chano and his chief of staff the 6th of December to plan the next phase of their intervention in Spain. Three days earlier, Filippo Anfuso, Chano's representative, reported that the nationalists acted as if they were carrying on a colonial war, and that Franco needed Italian troops and Italian generals if he was expected to deal a decisive blow. We've already talked about the Spanish Civil War as a colonial war at the beginning of our series, following Preston's, Graham and Balfour's insight. By the way, the repression was taking place in the Francoist rearguard, but also because, and that's obvious, the army and the officers that were carrying on with that war were a colonial army and colonial officers. It is for us interesting to find out that the Italians had the same perception, but of course highlighting the military aspects, not the repressive ones. In this meeting, we could also find Wilhelm Canaris, that represented Nazi Germany interests. Canaris was a bit pessimistic about the situation. 
This week, General Wilhelm Foppel presented his credentials to Franco and became the new German chair the first in Spain. And that day, before this meeting between Mussolini and his guys took place, he sent a telegram to Germany that said the following. We are now faced with the decision either to leave Spain to herself or to throw in additional forces. It was clear to both Germany and Italy that more investment in their Spanish enterprise was needed. Mussolini in that meeting tried to press on the Germans and ask them to send more troops, material and personnel to try in Franco's forces. But Canaris had to remain firm in his position, as requested by the Führer and his staff. Germany would not send forces in strength to Spain, as that would have international repercussions that could harm the German rearmament program. It had to be Mussolini carrying the biggest burden of cooperation. That's all for this week. Here you can find the link to our episode covering the second half of the 19th century, where we talk about anti-clericalism in Spain. Please don't forget to like the video and subscribe. If you enjoyed it, share it. We have to bring light to the history of Spain. If you are able to support us in our Patreon channel, as these heroes already did, or offer us a coffee, this could also be great and would help us to carry on and improve the project. Let's make this possible together. Thanks for your attention, goodbye and salute.